Thanks for joining us on Capitol View. We are speaking this week with Senator Terry Bryant. She is from Illinois Senate District 58. Senator, we're going to begin this portion of our uh, conversation today with an issue that uh, has been discussed for quite some time. Republicans have been calling for state ethics reforms. What would you like to see in this regard? Um, so we had a we had a package of bills that addressed this. Um, those bills uh, were never called. Um, in fact, I think I might have jotted down a couple bill numbers, but um, uh, Senate Bill 4013 and Senate Bill 4012 um, were a part of that package. Um, they dealt mostly with the ability to lobby after you get out of office. Uh, I, I think really, I, I am not one of those individuals who thinks all lobbyists are terrible. I personally think that there are a lot of really good lobbyists who are experts on issues. I'm the minority spokesperson for energy. And, you know, I told you my wheelhouse is Department of Corrections. So coming into energy, I had to find some lobbyists that know a lot more about energy than I do uh, to, to kind of check me out on some things, right? Um, but we have, we've tried to address the revolving door issue, but right now the revolving door issue, even with some changes is so weak that you could uh, be a lobbyist six months after leaving office. And it really should be a minimum of one year because quite often if you are uh, allowed to become a lobbyist six months after you've left office, you're still seeing uh, bills that either you filed or someone that you're very close to has filed. And so I think, first of all, we've got to fix that revolving door that has to do uh, with lobbyists. And then um, actually the bill numbers that I gave you, I think had to do with the RICO Act, but we had some on the revolving door issue. You know, everyone's familiar with the federal RICO Act, but we also have a state version of that RICO Act. And the two bill numbers that I gave you, uh, 4013 and 4012, address the ability for state's attorneys uh, and grand juries uh, to be able to um, investigate and indict on RICO. So if there is a, a legislator or a government official who is engaged in bribery um, or in any of the things that we've seen in recent years, uh, right now, you have to wait for the feds to do wiretaps to actually indict that person. I don't think that we should have to wait for the federal government to step in. It's a national embarrassment for us that we have to wait for the feds to step in. We should have that ability statewide. And I'm going to back up just a little bit, because if you think about the fact that um, when, when Speaker Madigan was in place and his daughter, Lisa, was the attorney general, you actually had a, a father-daughter situation where the attorney general would have had to indict her own father, where we should be able to have the ability to convene a grand jury or for state's attorneys to engage in that. And I think that does away with a lot of what we've seen uh, as far as ethics violations go. Okay, I want to move on to uh, another issue very important in your uh, district with Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Higher education received a major funding increase this year. What are your thoughts about that increase and how that money is being spent? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I am a member of um, the Higher Education Working Group, bipartisan, bicameral, They've accomplished a lot of really good things, um, such as uh, something called the AIM High program. So that is for students who go to Illinois high schools and go to Illinois public universities and colleges. Uh, we're finally seeing some uh, hi uh, higher ed entities really start to have buy-in with the AIM High, and that's keeping students here in Illinois. So it's taken a couple of years for that really to take off and for some of the universities to, to really get engaged. SIU has, from the beginning, has tried to engage with AIM High and they're doing a super good job of making that possible for individuals. So um, I think the higher ed working group, uh, because it's bipartisan and bicameral, I think we're gonna see some movement maybe on a funding formula for universities that would be really similar to what we have 
for uh, K, pre-K through 12, like to see that happen. I think that gives benchmarks for where a college or university uh, has to reach in order to get better funding. Um, we did have an increase in the funding. Some of it was MAP grant. That's all good stuff. But um, as somebody who's very blue collar and uh, worked really hard all my life, I know that sometimes those who are in the support staff are the ones who get left behind. I would really like to see us use the money first to make sure that we keep good students here in Illinois. We draw those students back from other states, but that support staff, they took pay freezes or really minimal raises while administrators um, were getting raises in the past, maybe not as much as they would like to get, uh, but a lot of the support staff really got kicked to the curb. So I'd like to see some of those dollars used um, for support staff. Uh, I think that's a good use of money because that support staff is what keeps the wheels of higher education work functioning. And we do spend a lot of time trying to make sure that we get good um, professors, uh, good, um, uh, good instructors, but sometimes we leave that support staff and they, they never catch up because you always get percentage raises. So it seems like they never catch up. I hope that our uh, public universities and colleges remember that those folks really bit the, uh, really bit the bullet for many years. And, and now okay. they make it up. Just a few minutes left. And uh, I don't want to run out of time without asking hopefully two more questions. One, as you know, last year there was some success in getting licensing reforms for certain professions. What else, if anything, would you like to see? Uh, well, we, so we have to have better reciprocity um, between uh, ourselves and other states. Uh, I understand that some states have different laws in regard, to, especially where medical is concerned. The two mm -hmm. biggest areas that we have problems are in medical and in education. So um, if, you're a if you're a teacher in, in Illinois, a lot of Illinois teachers went to Missouri. They went because Missouri has better laws for reciprocity. Their um, pensions are uh, it's, it, it better than ours are. You have to work longer here. Uh, to get that pension, but reciprocity is hard. So if you are a Missouri teacher or an Indiana teacher or a Kentucky teacher or Wisconsin, you name the state, it's difficult to come to Illinois. One, because our laws on reciprocity are very strict. Two is because um, IDFPR or our regulating agency, they're slow. I mean, super slow. Like to the point that if you have say a, a physical therapist, who is could be licensed in multiple states and has a job here waiting in Illinois, but it can take three months, six months, nine months to get them licensed. Uh, and by that, you know, the hospital's waiting for them. They're waiting. They can't wait for a job. For yeah, six and I know that's I, I know that's an issue for nurses as well. Oh, that the nurses I've, who move to Illinois, the, the Illinois does not participate in the compact that most states participate in. So you can't get your Illinois uh, license with reciprocity as you described for teachers yes. either. That's so I know right. there's, and, there's yeah, been work on trying to change that, but it has never gone anywhere. Um, so the, the nurse compact, we've made some, uh, we made really some strides with that. I think yeah. we'll do more of the reciprocity issue, but IDFPR, that, that agency, um, the legislature continues to pile on things that people have to be licensed for. We have a, 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 a load of, uh, of um, uh, requirements in Illinois that other states don't have. We haven't always given our agencies the money. And again, I don't just want to throw money at agencies, but they have to have the ability to have good, com good, good uh, computer access. I mean, good grief. When I came into the legislature in 2014, we had agencies still using DOS, right? So it's, it's crazy the computer systems that we're making them use. And so I think if we're gonna have money that is given to agencies, IDFPR is one that we need to bring them into this century. Okay, time for one more question. Uh, and it is related to licensing. What else do you think Illinois needs to do to attract and retain jobs in the state? Just, so jobs right now, just getting employees. 
is a national problem right now. And I just heard a, a really good presentation recently of a national speaker who said, who talked about this being a national problem. One is because we're all getting older. And, and so we have a generational issue with that. Um, so we're gonna have to be making some transitions to the fact that we might not get the same personal service that we have become accustomed to. I'm 60, I don't mind saying that because I don't get my senior discount. Um, but <laughs> we might not be able to have all of those things that we've become accustomed to having. So we might have a little more self-service kind of things. Uh, but to make Illinois a more business friendly state, good grief, we have to get rid of some of the rules that we have for businesses. I know everybody thinks minimum wage increase is awesome for people, but it's not awesome for businesses and it is killing them. And it's causing an increase in our inflation, all of those kind of things. But I think more than anything, when we're talking about this question, it's economic development. And we have piecemealed economic development in Illinois for many years. What I mean is you have to look at it holistically. Um, in the in the city of Cairo, uh, in uh, Senator Fowler's district, they're do, trying to do a little bit better job of when you're looking at, do we want to have the Cairo Port District? What does that mean? It isn't just bringing people into work. You also have to have housing. You have to have daycare. You have to have good schools. You have to have public safety. People want to know when they lay their head down at night, they're safe. Yeah, I Holistic. think you said... View, yeah, I think you right? set us up for a, a whole separate program uh, on that with that issue, because that is a big one uh, and certainly something we've talked about before. Senator Terry Bryant of Illinois Senate District 58. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. And we would love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas, interview ideas and comments. The address is contact at WSIU.org. More news and analysis now with our guest, John Jackson of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, and Brendan Moore is the State House reporter for Lee Enterprises. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Glad to be here. Always a pleasure, Fred. All right, John, I wanna start with you. As you know, if Iowa is any indication it appears the 2024 presidential race will once again be Trump versus Biden. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker was in Iowa this week to push President Biden's message. And on ABC's This Week, Pritzker said that the presidential race will come down to independence. The governor did not seem surprised when he was asked about the fact that Trump did not sign a loyalty oath for the Illinois ballot in which candidates pledge not to advocate the overthrow of the government. Your thoughts on that and on the race ahead? Well, for starters, I think the race is probably over. Uh, it'd be very, very unusual now if circumstances were to produce anyone but Biden versus Trump. And I think the one caveat there is whether or not there is a health scare from one or the other, or both for that matter, before the national conventions. But going forward, uh, I see no real option likely for either of the two remaining candidates that challenge Trump. I think the governor is right. The independents will be a crucial block here. They are the undecideds primarily. That includes pure independents, Democrats who lean independent, and Republicans who lead in, lean independent. They can still go over. And the reason that's important is the base is going to be solid for both of these candidates. There's no doubt about it. There is the remaining question on the base, however, which one will turn out better? For the Democrats, that includes uh, Black voters, it includes uh, young voters, it includes Hispanic voters, all of whom right now are not showing enough signs of enthusiasm for Biden. On the Trump side, that includes rural voters, it includes uh, those who are from the evangelical churches, uh, and it includes um, uh, those who are less well-informed, frankly. And if they don't turn out for Trump, then he won't do the magic that he did uh, in 16. 
So turnout is absolutely crucial. Now as to the governor's comment about Trump not obeying the Illinois law and flouting it, and basically there's no consequence to it. It used to have been a possible scandal, but uh, there are no sanctions on Trump flouting either law or convention, so it really doesn't matter. He'll be on the ballot in Illinois, I, I think, without any question. And yeah, and usual, I'm and I'm sure you saw many of the entrance polls in Iowa. Uh, voters were asked uh, about would a conviction uh, affect your thoughts on President uh, Trump's ability to once again hold the highest office in the land. And one poll after another, they all had about the same results that two thirds of the folks questioned said, nope, conviction wouldn't matter. He's still qualified to be president. Well, those are the earmarks of a cult and a person that is charismatic in one definition of that term. And I just think that indicates how strong and how much uh, Trump has come to dominate and define the Republican Party. Yeah, it's a, a moment where a poll was, I think, extremely important to put this into perspective and to understand uh, where we are right now in, in this country and, and understand the views of, uh, of the folks who are, are going in to vote. So we need to move on, Brendan, and we move to an interesting story now that you broke uh, a story that proves even if you're elected and you get legislation passed, sometimes nothing happens. Yeah, Fred, uh, it, it, that's probably the best way to sum it up. Um, so basically, the story I wrote was about this law that was passed and signed by uh, Governor Bogoyevich back in 2004 that created a registry for arsonists. So basically, if you're convicted of arson or found not guilty by reason of insanity, uh, you would have to register um, and you'd be put into a database akin to a sex offender registry. Um, this came to the legislature from a group of survivors from one of the worst school fires in American history. Um, that bunch of them became firefighters. And they said, you know, we found that uh, these guys tend to do it uh, more than once. So you know, it would be a good tool for, for law enforcement and good for the community to know, you know, who who's living among them if they've been convicted of arson. So basically, uh, these arsonists would have to register where they live, where they work, where they go to school uh, with their local law enforcement agency. They would turn it over to the state police who would put it into a database and the state police would turn it over to the office of the state fire marshal who would disclose it publicly uh, on their website. Um, the problem is that uh, the legislature made it uh, subject to appropriation, which is which is a popular word here in Springfield. Um, there's a lot of great ideas uh, that often are just waiting to be funded. Um, and oh, there has been a lot of money to go around in Illinois in the past couple of decades. Um, this is so this is one of those uh, items that uh, subject to appropriation, the legislature, at least according to the state police, never appropriated the money to build up for the state police to build out this database. So 20 years have gone by and the literally, I mean, there is an arsonist registry. It's on the fire marshal's website, but it's just a blank space with no names. And um, so it's, it's just an example of how you can have a really good idea in the legislature. It passed with no opposition. Uh, yeah. There was this, there's a press release when it when it when it when it went out. Everyone was saying it's a great idea, um, but in terms of implementing it, uh, it just shows that there are some challenges, um, which and it could makes be you wonder what else what else is out there. <laughs> are there other laws that have been passed, mm -hmm. and for one reason or another, a funding deficit, an enforcement deficit, uh, mm -hmm. or what have you, uh, oversight that nothing has been done. So very important journalism, great story. Uh, and yeah. I'm glad you did it. Yeah, no, and, and and I mean, there are so many examples of this. And and I think that, you know, there, this is something that we could look at as, you know, for example, uh, with the uh, registry for, for assault weapons, um, how is that gonna 
how is that going to turn out um, yeah. as as the state police try to to to, to build up that registry? So yeah. absolutely. Yep, you got to have the money and you got to have the oversight. When we move on now, John, to another interesting story, Illinois lawmakers quietly scaled back a popular tax credit, and now a former governor wants that tax credit back. Uh, this story, I thought, John, was interesting on many levels. This is a great story. This is vintage Pat Quinn, and it tells us that Pat Quinn hasn't retired from politics yet. Uh, Pat Quinn was always the gadfly. He was always the outsider. He was always finding something that he could get exercised over and get the voters exercised over. Probably his best accomplishment in terms of long-term impact was the cutback amendment where he got the size of the Illinois House literally reduced by one third and changed from uh, cumulative voting. Uh, that was a Pat Quinn operation. Problem was when he got to be governor, you can't continue to be an outsider. <laughs> Although even then he tried at times. So this was a popular uh, addition that would adjust the standard deduction for dependents and its growth with the change in the inflation index. Uh, they knew what they were doing when they made that change because they decided they needed that revenue and the revenue is not inconsequential in terms of the balanced budget that the Democrats were pushing. So there's no doubt that what somebody was fairly well informed about this, but they didn't want to make a big production out of it, yeah. although along and comes Pat make, Quinn to make it, production it of make, it. And it didn't make news when, the, when yeah, this, this right. occurred. So it was discovered after the fact, uh, and now this tax credit will not be increased with inflation. So uh, we'll have to watch and see uh, where this all goes. But uh, the, the state, of course, is in some financial trouble. So it's, it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, it, do, it doesn't seem as likely that this would be restored, but we'll, we'll have to see. I think it's very unlikely they're going to go yeah. back and take this yeah. out of it. The no budget. one even wanted to take credit for yeah, whose idea blame. this was. Yeah. That was another interesting thing in the story. It took a, it was like, who did this basically? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's really emblematic of uh, sometimes really important things happening yeah. uh, that we don't always know about. Yeah. So very interesting. Just a few minutes left. So I do need to move on, Brendan, to uh, something else here to wrap up. During his Iowa victory speech on Monday, former President Trump said that the country should eliminate voting by mail, falsely stating that it leads to voter fraud. Uh, meantime, a new Illinois proposal calls for expanding uh, vote by mail. Tell us about that. Yeah, so there's a proposal out there from State Representative Carol Ammons that would basically allow any election authority, so usually a county, but sometimes there are some cities that do it as well, that uh, would allow them to make uh, early voting or uh, absentee voting, uh, vote by mail, a uh, default setting. So basically, even if you haven't applied for a vote by mail ballot, you're going to be sent a vote by mail ballot. Um, to or every registered voter is going to be sent to vote by mail ballot. Um, so this is done in, I believe it's done in about eight states. Uh, it's very popular on the West Coast. Um, I think like Washington, Oregon, um, you know, California is basically all vote by mail. And the idea is to increase voter participation. Uh, a lot of those states have are known for being higher voter participation states. Um, and it would kind of continue a trend in Illinois of expanding uh, different forms of voting. Um, Illinois, uh, you know, for instance, has no excuse absentee uh, voting. So you can request to vote by mail ballot um, no matter what. Uh, you, you just don't want to go out to the polls or go out early or whatever it is. Uh, you, can, you can get a vote by mail ballot now in Illinois. So this would kind of keep expanding that. Um, lawmakers are looking at several different ways to expand access to voting. Um, they had a subject matter hearing last week, um, talk about, you know, increasing accessibility. And so, you know, this is just one, uh, part of the discussion. Uh, I, I don't know if this bill in particular will pass, but it might get roped into a larger elections bill, um, if they do win this session. Yes. Important to, uh, make people aware of this. 
uh, because unlike some things that are kind of a question mark in terms of public policy, uh, there is a lot of research about expanding options for different ways for people to vote. And the research, in a nutshell, says if you expand options, it increases voter participation. So right. it does and, increase turnout. It does work. And, uh, and, and, and I think we saw that during the pandemic that uh, a lot of people got comfortable with uh, vote by mail and, you know, are more open to it. And so I think in the future, we're going to see that's going to be one of the lasting impacts of that in states like Illinois, where they're going to want to expand options. And, you know, I think the pandemic kind of exacerbated that. Absolutely. Brendan and John, thank you both for being with us. Glad to do it. Thank you, Brad. And thank you at home as well for all of us at WSIU. I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week.